It's time for the Bill Ferguson Show. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. Welcome, everybody. This is show number 237, and it's just after Thanksgiving. It's been almost two weeks since I put out a show, so my apologies for the delay. But, you know, sometimes life gets busy and or we take some time off, in this case, sometime for Thanksgiving. So hopefully you had a fantastic turkey day. And you were thankful for all the people that make your life as wonderful as it is. Um, Something fun that I'm doing for myself. I bought a new box set of Star Trek TNG, the next generation, all seven years, over 135 hours. And the reason I got this set in particular, it's a British import and it has an Italian dub track and Italian subtitles. And so now I've started watching these and it's just a fun way for me to practice my Italian at a relatively affordable rate. Uh, Because like if you buy an Italian movie that's two hours long, you might pay 10 to 20 bucks or a movie that has subtitles or uh, Italian dubbing. Uh, In this case, I got 136 hours for something like $72 from Amazon. So it's 50 cents an hour of Italian practice. And I've only watched uh, The Encounter at Farpoint, the first episode for the true Star Trek Next Generation fans. And it's always curious to me, I I now know enough Italian to be humored by, amused by, I guess I find it interesting that when the dubbing, the translate English from, from English to Italian, and they have an actor read the lines, and then they also have subtitles, and they don't match. You know, sometimes they're exact matches, word for word, but... It appears that the person who does the dubbing doesn't communicate with the person who does the translation for the subtitles. So they're each kind of trying their best to translate what is in English into Italian uh, so they don't match. It's also uh, a challenge because I'm not that good in Italian. I mean, I'm kind of conversational, but it's fascinating to me because I can understand what is said often and what is written often and see how there's there's a little nuance in there because translation is not an exact science. Anyway, I babble on about that, and I'm going to read some uh, listener email questions. Uh, but before that, I have a little treat from Star Trek for you. Spazio. Ultima frontiera. Questi sono i viaggi della nave stellare Enterprise. La sua missione è quella di esplorare strani, nuovi mondi, alla ricerca di nuove forme di vita e di nuove civiltà, per arrivare là dove nessuno è mai giunto prima. I know. Wasn't that amazing? That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, so they did a nice job with that. Uh, anyway, on with the uh, on with the show. Uh, email here from a listener, and I didn't even mark who this is from, so my apologies. Uh, hopefully they'll know who they are. On the last couple of shows, you have smartly advised to be cautious with property investments. However, I didn't hear any safe alternative offered for people that want to... Uh, that want property exposure in their portfolio. Some people, uh, gosh, I can't read. Since people have continued to ask about these investments, I think it would be a good idea to suggest they consider REIT, R-E-I-T, index funds such as Vanguard REIT Index Fund. Uh, And they give a a symbol here. This is V-G-S-I-X. And they are absolutely right. I should suggest that. I have in the past gone over that. 
but apparently it's been a while. It's one of those things I try to not be too overly repetitive in the show so that it's entertaining, but I also know that I get new people that, you know, maybe have listened to five or ten episodes, not something a year ago, so things come up again. Uh, so hopefully I'm finding the right balance for new people and regular listeners. Uh, the symbol again, VGSIX, that's Vanguard's REIT Index Fund. Fidelity also has REIT funds and many of the other ones. And a REIT, especially a REIT Index Fund, I adore those. Um, I usually limit myself and my clients' portfolios to no more than 10% of your total portfolio into uh, a REIT fund. And just as a reference, the one I've already mentioned the letters for, it does have a $3,000 minimum. And the expense ratio is higher than some other index funds because of the complexities involved in buying REITs, which is why you probably should not buy them from a broker. If they're suggested to you, you definitely don't want to buy them. Uh, But if you have a little bit more money, if you have at least $10,000, you can get the Vanguard REIT Admiral shares. And the Admiral shares simply means that it's more expensive to get in, but the expense ratio is lower. In this case, the expense ratio is 0.12. And the Admiral shares, again, $10,000 to get in. So you do need a portfolio of at least $100,000. $100,000. Otherwise, you'll go over the 10% uh, recommendation that I make. The symbol for that is VGSLX. So that's a little bit about REITs. I had another email and someone basically asked, given the market highs, uh, should I invest now or should I wait? Well, if you are a long-term investor, you should invest now. And that's only because you couldn't invest a year ago, which would have been really nice because the market's up about 20%. But I don't know the future, particularly with stocks. It is very difficult to predict, and you have to be right way more often than you're than you're wrong. Otherwise, you know, you, you could get out. Um, matter of fact, you, you could get out, let's say before 2008, you saw the crisis coming. So you missed two or three years of up, and then when it went down, Sure, you missed the down, but you missed the up. And then, of course, once it goes down, you've got to know when to get back in. So if it goes down 37% in 2008 and you wait a year to see if things settle out, you missed the almost 30% that it went back up in 09. It's clearly going up 30% after a loss of 37. You're still not even, but if you missed some of the up on the front side, if you missed part of the up on the back side, even if you do actually miss a large part of the drop, you could still end up underperforming someone that didn't do anything, that didn't buy and sell. Additionally, when with buys and sells, you create trading costs, which can be very small, and taxes, which could be not so small. So keep that in mind. Uh, another thing that people bring up a lot is we're at all-time highs. And this is now more obvious because Trump is bragging about how he has made the stock market go to all-time highs, which first of all is bullshit. The president and Congress have a little bit to do with the economy and the markets and what they can influence takes a significant amount of lag time. Uh, Is there some belief that Republicans are going to be more business friendly and maybe that helped the market? Maybe. I I, I don't know. It's hard to tease out one little piece of information from everything that is out there. But I will point out, you know, when someone says the markets had record highs, we had Record highs in 17 this year. We had record highs in 16 and 15 and 14 and I think 13. And then we had several years because of the drop in 08 that we didn't have record highs. But then we had record highs in 08 and 07. And then again, several years we didn't have record highs because of the big correction from the dot-com bubble of 2000. But then we had record highs in, I think it was 2000, 99, 98, 95, 94. And so this pattern goes out through all of time because... The stock market's long-term trend is up, and the long-term trend is up 10% per year. So to say that we have record highs in and of itself is kind of meaningless. And when someone says, should I invest now because of the record highs, if you didn't invest in the early 70s because of record highs when the Dow was below 1,000, the Dow is now around 23,000, I guess. I I don't even know because... I don't follow it that closely because I'm a long-term investor. 
Uh, there's a situation where you could have missed out on a lot of money, a lot of making money. You could have put in one million and now have twenty three million. It, it's amazingly powerful and amazingly reliable in the long run. And again, if you're a short term investor, you know you have to focus more on protection and and the cushion. And because this is going long, I have a thing planned out uh, next week to talk about the cushion. So we'll we'll do that uh, some next week. Uh, Another thing that I had a a Fox News watching friend talk to me about is how uh, Trump has finally corrected the market after years of down markets or flat markets. The markets are now up. They obviously have no fucking clue what they're talking about. And I find that very, very frustrating because... The uh, information that's made available to the average, to the public, about how the economy and investments work is pathetic at best. And if you watch Fox News, it's actually, oh, how do I want to say this? But misleading. I'll go with misleading and counterproductive. So the stock market is up 200, 300% since the bottom in 08. And it was up in 9, 10, 11, every single year. Now, I think it was 15, calendar year 15, where it was only up 1.4%, but it was still up. It wasn't a lot, but it was up. So the market has been up year after year after year. So anyone that says now the market's finally gone up is detached from reality. And that's very, very problematic when those people go to vote. Uh, Another thing that came up is uh, in uh, unemployment. Unemployment has fallen finally now that we have Republicans in charge. Well, again... Unemployment takes a, can take a long time to go down. It often it'll rise fast and then fall slowly. It fell from something like 10%, oh, I don't know, into the fives during Obama's eight years. And now it's fallen a, a few more tenths of percentage points. So almost all of the, the improvement took place from 2010 to 2016. And the trend has continued and it slowed down because it gets harder and harder to uh, lower the unemployment rate and the unemployment rate is fantastic. I also find it amazing that uh, people who watch Fox news now boast about how low the unemployment rate is when a year ago, those same people were very likely to say something about the unemployment rate is rigged. It's fake. It's not real. It's not the appropriate number to use any and every excuse about it's not the real unemployment number, but now it's on their side and they like it all of a sudden. And so that's the kind of stuff that really kind of pisses me off. Um, and one last thing, and this will segue into the topic for next week for uh, next week or so, <laughs> whenever I get the show out about the cushion, uh, someone wrote me an email and it said, uh, I have roughly 20% of my rollover IRA and the Vanguard total bond market index fund, Admiral shares. I am 20 years from retirement. God willing. Thank you. I appreciate the humor. Is this the the sort of bond fund you're recommending against right now? The rest of my holdings are in various market indices. What do you think about the fact that the market is running historic highs, which is why I had the rant for the historic highs. Uh, Should I just not sweat it and get into retirement? So yeah, I started answering this question even before I read it. My apologies. So, We talked about the historic highs. Don't worry about it. Uh, Should you worry about the market? Not if you're long-term. If you're 12 years or less from retirement, you should have money in the cushion. We've talked about this. We'll continue to talk about this. And I'm going to go over some details of it um, next week uh, so you can catch up on that. But the other question is the total bond market uh, from Vanguard. And this is one of those things that it's always a challenge for me. So I've tried to create this scale of 1 to 10. And it, it's something that I'm forming and building and revising in my head as t- we go through time. So on a scale of 1 to 10, you want to approach something like a portfolio of a 10. And when I say 10, I mean in your personal situation. What is the ideal portfolio for you? What provides you the safety if you need it in retirement, but yet the opportunity to make money, assuming, hoping, dreaming that you're going to live a long time. So there's this balance and we have data, we have historical data and we don't have the future data. And there's some things that make the portfolio better. There's some things that make it not so much better. So 
Can you get to the ideal 10 portfolio? I don't know, but let's try. I mean, eight or nine is really good. And the total bond market index fund often is a very good fund. And I'm thinking it's somewhere around a seven or an eight on this 10 point scale. So it's not that I recommend against it per se, although I'm about to, uh, I'm not putting it down on a one or, or a zero, like an annuity. So it's not horribly bad for your portfolio. It's just not as good as it could be. And there's two thoughts. One, if you are in this case, the, uh, the read the e- listener, I can't talk. The listener is 20 years from retirement. Why do you have money in bonds at all? No, this may come down to a matter of opinion. And if the stock market falls in the next year or two, especially if it falls and stays down 15, 20, 30%, uh, having money in bonds would look like a very fucking clever choice. I don't know the future and I'm not worried about one or two or five years from now. I'm worried about 20 years from now when this person's going to retire. You should have very small amount in bonds. I'm thinking three, five percent or ideally zero. I'm 50. Theoretically, I could probably retire at 55. It'd probably be something closer to 62 or 65, assuming Medicare still exists, because that's probably going to be my biggest problem. Like a lot of people is how do you afford for health care? when you retire and I'm, you know, 98, 99%, I guess in stocks because I want the long-term money. And while maybe I could retire in five years, it's probably not going to happen because this job's great fun. Why would I do that? Not everybody has this luxury. Now, as far as bonds and the cushion, you know, we'll talk about more of that in detail next week. The reason I don't like the total bond market index from Vanguard, even though it's a good choice. It's not a great choice. It invests in all types of bonds, including intermediate term and long-term bonds. Generally, short-term bonds are five years or less until they stop being a bond and they give you your money back. Intermediate is five and above, maybe to 10 or to 12, depending on who you ask. And long-term is from that 10 to 12, up to 20, and even up to 30-year long bonds. And the longer the bond, the more susceptible the more risk it faces if U.S. interest rates go up, if they're U.S. bonds. So the total bond market index has a generous portion in intermediate and long-term bonds. It's still a really nice balance, uh, but it has more international, I'm sorry, not international, more intermediate and long-term exposure than I would like. That's the problem I have with it. It gets worse the closer you get to retirement because if that is your cushion, The purpose of the cushion is to be very safe and conservative in case the stock market goes down. If stocks go down and interest rates go up, the bonds can fall also. Um, So it could be a double whammy. Not my, not my best choice. It's not awful, but I think you can do a little bit better. The other problem, if you use the total bond market index for your cushion is that you can't pick and choose what to sell. So this is a very, very critical part. I'll go over it more uh, next episode about why the cushion must have multiple positions, not an aggregate position like the total bond market. And it's also the same reason why I don't like target date funds. We'll talk more about that as we go on. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to talk about a movie, a movie you should check out called Leaving God. And we have the director i think the director executive producer he's everything because he did the movie all by himself john Follis is going to come and talk to us about that movie it's on vimeo uh you can go check it out we're going to talk about that in the links where you can find it and you're going to enjoy that but we're going to take a quick break first As you get older, you just ditch certain things as you get older, and it's a pleasure to do, right? I mean, for example, right, religion is a very good app. I wouldn't be a very spiritual man, right? I don't believe in God, right? Still Catholic. (laughs) Because there's nothing you can do when you're Catholic. Once you've started Catholic, frankly, there's no real way to stop being Catholic. Even not believing in God isn't regarded as sufficient reason to get out of the Catholic Church can be fairly fundamental to the whole thing, but no, Catholicism, the stickiest, most adhesive religion in the world. There's no website you can de-register online. You can't 
put up your membership card in front of a priest and go, feck ya, I'm out of here, and walk away. <laughs> you could join the Taliban. You'd merely be regarded as a bad Catholic. <laughs> I'm presuming a large chunk of you probably were raised Protestant. Give me a cheer if you had any Protestant upbringing at all. A fair few of you, right? Now, when you do the wafer thing, right, and take the, the hoax or whatever, thing, it represents the body of Christ. It's a metaphor, it's a symbol of the body of Christ. Oh, not when you're Catholic. When you're Catholic, it is the body of Christ. You suppose actually believe that it turns into the flesh of Christ in your mouth. Nobody fully explained this to me as a child. I would have spotted the floor relatively quickly in that. I would have gone, hang on, I might be eight, but I've eaten enough burgers, chicken McNuggets, right? Fish fingers and rashers to know there is no animal flesh in the world that jams itself to the roof of your mouth. And hoovers all of the moisture out of your body. Until you're looking at your mother going, can I hang it down with my finger? my mouth. And she's going, do not take it down with your finger. It's the body of Christ. Leave it where it is. And they're going to show me in the church. We're desecrating me from the entire world. Desiccated, by the way. Uh, All right, everybody. This is Phil Ferguson, and welcome back to the show. With me today, I have John Follis. I just did that wrong, didn't I, John? See, right. We, we <laughs> freaking talked about that. <laughs> oh, my God. And this is one take, of take two. Take no, two. no, no. I, I, I leave mistakes in because people need to know that I fuck up. Uh, John. Okay. John Follis. Yeah, there yeah, you see, go. It's going to be so fucking smooth. OK, with me today, I have John Follis, who just put out a movie. Well, May uh, called Leaving God. John, how are you? I'm terrific, Phil. Yeah, see, I'm like, how, fucking, how are you doing? It? I'm fucking smoother than Jesus, man. That That, that was clever. <laughs> we just talked about that, and I can't I can't believe I did that that wrong. But John Follis, F-O-L-L-I-S, if you want to look him up. And John, we were talking about in pre-show that no one can ever listen to because I deleted it. Um, the movie is not on YouTube because YouTube probably had issues with some of the uh, small audio clips that you put in there. Right. Uh, but they can find it on Vimeo. Yes, it's on Vimeo, and it's also on a website called Top documentaries.com so either one of those and and i'm sorry i'm sorry i i just yeah. got that wrong you think i would know yeah. top documentary films plural films top documentary films.com so either one of those two websites will get you to it and what i'll do what we talked about this also i will put uh, a link on my personal facebook page and the phil ferguson show facebook page uh, so if you can't find it, you can go find it there. And when I say movie, uh, dude, this is like 47 minutes. It's not two hours, right? Right. Uh, found it very fun to watch. It's a little cheeky, uh, fun, lighthearted, well done, well edited. And it's not going to bore you to death for two hours because you, you put all the content in, in under 50 minutes. Right. Uh, so why don't you kind of recreate maybe some of the content and I was going to be really clever and have sound bites. I was going to drop in, I'll, maybe I'll find a couple minute thing to show at the end, but, um, uh, you talk about your background a little bit. So what, let's start there. Uh, did you grow up with religion and how did that work out? Yeah, I grew up as a Catholic and kind of followed the, uh, the root of, a lot of Catholics of my generation, which uh, I'm 63 years old, so I don't know what Catholics uh, do these days when they grow up. But back then, it was communion and confirmation. I I guess they still do that. Today. I'm sure. I, I'm sure they do. Uh, so you know that was that was my background, and uh, went to church on Sundays with my parents until. I hit about uh, high school age, I guess, and then got a little bit more rebellious and uh, challenged going to church on Sunday. And I'm sure there were a few squabbles about that until they finally acquiesced. And then they stopped going to church, which was interesting. So that that was that was what I grew up. Well, I, I also I forgot to mention, in addition to the uh, training I had to go through for communion and confirmation, uh, when I became high, uh, junior high school age, 
my parents decided to send me to the the new local parochial junior high school. So I got three more years of Catholic uh, dogma during my junior high years, which I hated. Yeah. And I talk about that in the film. And and you'd think with all this information and education, they would have been able to convince you of the truth of all of this, but apparently that didn't work out. Well, you know, I, I, I think anyone who goes through through that um, doesn't necessarily not believe it's true. They just are kind of freaked out by a lot <laughs> of the contradictions that uh, this is a loving God that will send you to hell if you fuck up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, we're not. You know what I mean? I, yeah, we're not talking. Bit, there's a bit in my film, you may recall it film, where uh, George Carlin who I think also grew up Catholic does a very, very funny bit where he's talking about the contradictions that uh, he experienced as a Catholic. And, uh, you know, I don't want to spoil it for your, for your listeners, but it kind of comes down to what I just said. Well, it's funny. I, I think I actually had a George Carlin drop in my previous show a week or two ago where it was the one where, you know, he's the most powerful creator of the universe, but he, he just needs your money. He can't make yeah. money. Um, exactly. And, you know, exactly. it's just so comical to think about that. And so, uh, the, a joke that I've used for a while, I don't think I've said it on the show for a while. Um, I do actually donate to God from time to time. I, uh, I leave my wallet on the, uh, the, the little table next to my bed and he can come take whatever money he needs. <laughs> and so, uh, that way the, the church doesn't take part of it. He can have a hundred percent of whatever he needs. And, and there you, there you go. I wake up in the morning and the money is still there. So yeah, I guess he doesn't need it. I mean, he, he's everywhere, right? He can, he can just get what he wants. I, I, that's what they say. Yeah. Yeah. So you have leaving God. So at some point you, you know, you were confused, you were frustrated, you were conflicted because of the contradictions. Um, you're not Catholic now though, are you? No, no. And you know, I, I just want to make sure your viewers understand this film is not all about me because then it really would be a very boring film. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, even though, uh, part of it includes my, um, your, your testimony, my journey, uh, seeking the truth, which probably began when I was old enough to start thinking critically, maybe high school or college, you know, uh, up, up till now. So it, it does include uh, that, that journey. But uh, my main motivation for making the film was uh, just paying attention to the shifting tides in, in America around the idea of uh, traditional religion and God. And uh, the film really addresses that by pointing out that for the first time, uh, based on recent research that's been done, that for the first time in America, the largest religious group in America is the non-believers or, or non-traditional religious people. And, and, and to me, that, that was a pretty uh, significant yes. uh, shift, right? Because even not that long ago, uh, the, the non non-religion people who say they're n don't sub uh, uh, subscribe to any particular religion not that long ago that was between five and seven percent of people in america and uh just in the past i think 20 or 30 years that has now become the largest group at 25 percent i think the next largest group at like 23 percent is uh traditional protestants right so, so that's that was a significant uh, shift, and then of course by by doing the research, uh, I found out that it's not only uh, people like me and you and maybe some of the listeners who have uh, changed their traditional religious beliefs, but now more and more priests and ministers are quote coming out of the closet as non-believers, and that to me just kind of blew my mind. Right. And so I, I talk about that in the film as well. And of course, I, I don't recall if it was in the film, so forgive me. Uh, you probably mentioned that uh, people under 30 and definitely under 25 years of age, that number of 
non-religious is significantly higher even for them. Correct. Uh, Correct. Which, which, which means that it's really going when, when, when more younger people are kind of leading this, this shift to non-belief, that means that uh, it's not a great time to be in the church business. <laughs> well, I have a friend who is in charge of kind of like district level management of uh, Episcopal church for the Southern half of the United States. And he has told me that uh, a good 50 to 70% of their church locations are at risk of closing in the next five to 10 years. Yeah. Because they, they don't have any members and the members they have are very old. And one of the reasons they've been able to keep some of the churches open at all is because people die and leave them their estate. Right. But once there's nobody left, because there's no kids there, I mean, it, it used to be, and, and this is probably the case for you for sure. I know it was for me. You know, you, you have your high school and college where you rebel a little bit and you leave the faith. Um, but somewhere in your twenties or by the time you're 30, you have a couple kids and you go, Oh, I have to give them. I have to give them religion. I have to teach them morals. We have to go back to church and the cycle is repeated. Um, but now there's a break in that cycle and the 20 somethings and the 30 somethings are way less likely to take their kids. And so that's where these organizations are now trying to get into elementary schools. So they don't lose an entire generation. Right. And they're all there. I think they're really kind of freaking out trying to figure out what, Oh, they, they are. Can, what what they can do to kind of uh, to change this trend and uh, uh, you know they like any business that is is uh, realizing that uh, uh, the model that they were using for the past uh, couple of decades is no longer working now or trying to figure out maybe some creative ways to appeal to younger people as you just mentioned they're maybe just going after younger and younger people. But I, I really don't see the shift uh, going back to the way it was. I think once you, you – know, and, and a big a big contributing factor to this, Phil, as I mentioned in my film, is the Internet. Yes, I agree. I, I mean, since the mid-'90s, that's – if you look at the, uh, the, the bar graphs of uh, people leaving religion and changing their attitudes about religion and God, it, it really parallels – almost identically with the growth of internet use beginning in the mid nineties. Yeah. That, so, I mean, once a cat, once a genie is out, it's kind of hard <laughs> to put it back in. It, it's one of those things I say, the uh, nice thing about the internet is you can get any information. The bad thing is you can get any information. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the organized structure of religion where one and almost always man, one man tells several hundred people what to believe and they do it because they don't hear it from anybody else. Now you go on the internet and you have 100 people telling you what to believe and what to think. Uh, and just like my kids, uh, they know that email, any email they get can be a random time bomb in, in, to their lives and to their computer. And so they're very suspect of emails that they get. And it kind of teach them, teaches them maybe for the good or for the ill to be very skeptical of everything they see, everything they get, everything they read. And then they go to, to a church and a dude stands up there in a nice dress and tells them crazy things. And they go, no, wait a minute. <laughs> right. I, I mark as spam emails that are way less crazy than this. What the fuck are they talking about? Um, so I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I just, you know, going back to um, why, why I made the film and, and the, the trend, I think that's one, you know, I, I'm, I'm not trained as a filmmaker, so um, the idea of tr attempting to make any kind of a film that I thought would be worthy of viewers was a kind of intimidating uh, idea to me. But because I thought this this trend that we're talking about was really, really sig significant and timely, and I mean, what bigger th – what bigger theme is there than God, right? I mean, that's that's something that um, I think every everyone has some feelings about, whether they share the feelings that you and I have, or whether they're they're very religious. It's certainly something that uh, touches everyone on on kind of an emotional level. So, 
Uh, that's why I thought uh, this this film would be interesting as it kind of explores uh, the shifting trend, why it's happening. And, and again, as I mentioned, the fact that now more and more priests and ministers are coming out, which is a there could be a great documentary just on that subject alone. Uh, I mean, because when I when I found out that now priests and ministers, I mean, I, it's it's probably nothing new that priests and ministers uh, kind of changed their their feelings once they started doing it for a while and started, uh, you know, questioning things themselves. But the fact that they're now kind of coming out publicly, it's kind of like where, you know, gay people were 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe 10, 20 years from now. A, a minister coming out as a non-believer or an atheist will be like, oh, you know, whatever. But you know, right now it's 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 really scary uh, for these 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 men and I guess women who are clergy members uh, to uh, identify themselves as someone who no longer believes. I mean, th- these people get death threats from you know their hardcore uh, congregations who just. Uh, now feel like you know these people don't deserve to live because they're 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 being possessed by the devil right so i mean it's a really interesting um topic to explore and i only i only touch on it a little bit but i think maybe in 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 next few years uh there's going to probably be more um uh stories about this phenomenon well, a few people have become really well known. Uh, Jerry DeWitt comes to mind for leaving religion uh, as a minister, and a lot of people do it and just kind of disappear and don't make a big public scene about it. But I know in my past, before my business was, you know, basically the only thing that I do to make money, on a couple occasions I lost a job, and that's a really scary place to be when you have to try to find a new job. Now, if the only job you've had really as an adult is being a minister, you can possibly convince yourself or question yourself, what skills do I have? But I think they're over- overlooking a lot of abilities that can be useful in other businesses. But uh, that transition could be very scary, let alone the congregation revolting on them, like you said. Yeah. And you mentioned Jerry DeWitt and I uh, included uh, a clip uh, from a documentary that was done about him uh, done by the New York Times. And I give him so much credit. I mean, it takes a lot of courage for the reasons you just mentioned for someone to come out publicly the way he did. And I I don't know that there's any uh, minister or pastor that's been more public about their um, change of beliefs than, than Jerry. And he's had a very difficult time, very difficult time. And he's still uh, finding it uh, challenging to make a living. I know that. I, yeah. He and I have, have communicated uh, very briefly, but I've been uh, following him and he's doing his podcast. And I think he's got uh, some other job that has nothing to do with his um, preaching abilities. But uh, you're right. It, it's uh, it's very hard. I, I know it's been very rough for him. And I just ironically for something totally unrelated to this content, uh, talked to Jerry just uh, last week. Um but he, he's moved. He's doing he's doing much better. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, go listen to his podcast if you want to hear more about his life. Um, it's funny. I'm going to circle back. You mentioned that you're not a filmmaker or you didn't have training in it. I'm actually kind of surprised by that because, uh, John, I, I don't want to be too flattering, but this was pretty good. How, how did you how did this come well, together? I mean, well, you uh, know, the um, the only formal training and filmmaking I've had has been um, 35, 40 years ago. And I'm doing the math here. Yeah, it was about <laughs> 40 years ago, actually. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I took a adult uh, education class in filmmaking. Um, and, and this was before the internet. So the computer was an old uh, eight millimeter film, black and white film, but, uh, had an opportunity to, uh, come up with an idea for a film and, uh, direct it and edit it 
and uh, even act in it. So I, I, I really love the experience of storytelling through that class that I took, but that was the only formal training. Now, having just said that, my career, as you know, Phil, is, is uh, advertising. So um, a- as an advertising guy, we would often hire production companies, film production companies, to shoot the commercials that our agency had created. So uh, even though um, I was only dealing with a 30-second or occasionally a 60-second format, as creative director and copywriter and art director, it was my job to be able to tell a story, right? an entertaining story and a persuasive, convincing story um, within that time period. And so the fact that I was kind of trained in um, uh, communicating with an audience that wasn't necessarily that interested in what you were talking about and try to um, engage them somehow – uh, for that time period, I think certainly helped uh, with my ability to kind of tell tell this story in an engaging way. Now, you have won a couple of awards. Uh, why don't you tell us about these and, and how does that happen? Yeah, I, I'm, I, I was, uh, again, like I said, I, I, I didn't know if I could even make a film, never mind make someone that, make a film that was, was worthy of, uh, of viewing. But when I completed it and it, it, you know, I really, um, I, I wanted to put out something that I felt was as good as it can be. So before I did the final edit, Phil, I did a couple of private screenings with, uh, people who are not necessarily good friends of mine <clears throat> who I knew could give me a very, uh, honest, um, objective, uh, perspective of the film. And after a couple of those screenings, I, I got some very constructive, uh, criticism that then allowed me to go back and, and do some more editing and, and, and really, as a result, improve the final product. And once I did complete it, what filmmakers often do, if they think their film is, uh, is decent, is then submit it to various film festivals around the country or around the world. And uh, I entered, I think, probably a dozen and a half now about a dozen film festivals and I got accepted in five of them. And in two of them, I was given a first time filmmaker award, which was kind of cool. So that's how it works. Well, I'm looking here. One of them was the uh, Hollywood international film festival. You apparently were the winner of that. Is it, or is it a sub subcategory or something? I, I was, uh, Yes, I was a winner. There, there are multiple winners. It, it's the uh, Hollywood. It's a very long name. Hollywood. I'm looking at the award here, right here. International Independent Documentary. <laughs> so it's only documentaries, um, and believe me, there are a lot of great documentary films. So just to be uh, accepted in a festival like that, especially if it's based in Hollywood, was was an honor. But then to be uh, given a first-time filmmaker award was was uh, very exciting. Yeah, and and of course, in case we missed it or you missed it earlier listening, the title of the film is called "Leaving God." Uh, you know, so you can search for "Leaving God." You can search for John Follis. Uh, of course, it's on uh, Vimeo. Uh, but John, I I do want to go back to this uh, advertising thing because that's a fun story. Uh, you somehow ended up advertising for a church why don't you walk us through that yeah well you asked me about my uh, religious background after I decided that uh, Catholicism wasn't working for me anymore it didn't mean that I uh, didn't believe in God I still did and I just began to search for uh, other channels, I guess you could say, of uh, uh, staying involved on a spiritual level, because I, I, I thought if God was as um, powerful and important as uh, I thought he was, then I wanted to kind of understand it all better, understand him and everything that was related to God better. So I uh, sought out, when I moved to New York, in my late 20s, I 
stumbled across a church. It was actually a Protestant church, not far from where I lived in Manhattan, that uh, used to be the uh, church where Norman Vincent Peale was the minister. And if you're, any of your listeners are over 50 or 60, perhaps they re- are familiar with the name of Norman Vincent Peale. Do you know the name, Phil? Uh, it, it pops into my head that he sold stuff on TV. Norman Vincent Peale was uh, a minister from, I guess, uh, well, he became a minister maybe starting from the, the early 30s when he was a young guy until he died in 1984. And for something like 36 years, he was the minister of this church in Manhattan, which was called the Marble Collegiate Church. And Norman's deal was that uh, he was very uh, media savvy. He was really way ahead of his time, which is probably why you associate him with selling stuff, uh, because uh, he he was one of the first ministers that gained national and I think even international prominence from his uh, his writing. I must be thinking of like Ron Popeil or something like that. I, I, just, I, 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 I was thinking of fishing okay, poles. Okay, so so you don't know Norman? Vincent no, Peel, but, I guess I don't. But maybe 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 you, the the name of uh, his his book um, will ring a bell. He wrote a book called "The Power of Positive Thinking." Uh, that uh, was published in 1951, and I think it's still <clears throat> on the top ten list of most uh, published uh, and read books of all time. So that kind of that put him on an international um, uh, map, and uh, he began uh, televising also uh, from his uh, his pulpit in Manhattan. I'm not sure how early he began doing that, but I first found out about him when I was living in Chicago. What you know, switching channels on a Sunday morning, and one of the markets they were hitting was the Chicago market. I suppose they were hitting you know, major metropolitan area, uh, uh, areas. And uh, I was really, um, I, w- I was really, uh, engaged from his, uh, his sermons. He, unlike the sermons I used to listen to, uh, growing up as a Catholic, Norman really had a gift for public speaking. He was entertaining. He was, uh, self, uh, self deprecating, is that is that the right word? Yes, it is. <laughs> because self-defecating is something De- totally different. Yeah, I, I de- self-defecating is not self-deprecating is the correct I think uh, term. So he was very self-deprecating. He was funny, uh, uh, and he was very positive. You know, growing up Catholic, it, it, it wasn't the mo- they weren't the most upbeat uh, sermons, but but Norman's sermons always made you feel better after listening to him. So when I ended up. Moving from Chicago to New York, one of the first things I did was to check out this church where he was speaking from, and uh, I, I had the opportunity of uh, catching the last two years of his preaching at the church, and and really enjoyed uh, listening to his sermons. You can still find them, I'm, I'm sure, on uh, YouTube. But uh, you know, he's he he didn't he didn't rely. A lot. I mean, now I'm listening to them as a, as kind of a non-believer. I, I'm listening to them with a different perspective. But uh, he, he's um, he really built up that church, and I really had a very positive experience with that church, and began getting more and more involved with the church, uh, to the point where eventually um, one of the associate ministers who knew I had this very successful New York ad agency asked me if I would be uh, interested in helping to market the church. And so that's how I got involved with uh, doing an ad campaign for the church in 1998. And of course, it it went well, and you even got to be on like TV and radio and newspapers and magazines promoting or talking about the ad campaign that you created. Yeah, I, I you know it was just kind of like a a, a one year um, contract, so uh, I figured, well, let me let me give it a shot and see what I can do, and ended up working with them for fourteen years. Uh, but I, at the time, Phil, I was very passionate about the church. I thought it was a great place. What I liked about it was uh, not only did I, I think the sermons were uh, were, were good, but uh, they had so many programs uh, and um, organizations and groups that I I thought were, were terrific. Um, they did a lot of uh, uh, socially conscious uh, um, 
uh, help in the community. They had a telephone crisis line that I actually volunteered for, which I thought was great. Uh, to uh, you, you go through 50 hours of training, and then they allow you to be on the on the lines where people call up with their problems. And uh, they they were helping the homeless. They were they were doing a lot of very positive things for the community. And they also had a lot of fun social groups. They one of the groups that I uh, really uh, got involved with for a number of years was they had a singles group, and uh, would go on uh, different. Uh, uh, group activities and uh, was really a lot of fun. So I, I had a lot of passion for the church and came up with a campaign that uh, ended up uh, getting a lot of positive press and, and, and doing really well for the church. Well, and it's is a very interesting story because you enjoyed the church. You had a lot of uh, fellowship there. You, you were paid by the church to advertise the church for many years. And even part of the story you told in the movie in kind of a way uh, awkwardly idolized by a lot of the younger people that found the church because of the marketing campaign that you had created. But then you made one tragic (laughs) flaw. And why don't you tell us what that tragic flaw was? Oh, we can't do that. Phil, uh, no one would watch the film. We'll leave that as a cliffhanger. So if you want to find out what the tragic thing was that John, John, Paulus did you, you check out the movie uh you you're gonna want to watch it 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 was really kind of stunning and and again i don't want to spoil it too much but the logic you had about why they shouldn't be doing that just from an economic standpoint should have been enough but but they still couldn't help themselves um it was a really fascinating thing and and um uh, yeah. So, uh, like you, more and more people are leaving churches. Um, and you know, are you going to make another movie? Are you going to make a follow up? You know, God Part Two or something? Mm, you know, um, <laughs> I had so much fun making this one, Phil, and I, I'm very uh, pleased with the way it turned out and the positive response it's been getting. Um, I, I never like to say no about, or never like to say never about anything, but, um, I've kind of shift my focus. I'm, I'm at the age, Phil, where I, I'm, I'm trying to fill up my bucket list. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I once you hit your sixties, you never know if you're going to be around next week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I'm, I'm only 50, but I, I understand that feeling. So this was one of the things on my bucket list. Uh, I, I made it. I, 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 don't really have any uh, strong desire at this point to make another film. Last night, I uh, did something that I've been fantasizing about since I was a teenager. I decided to join a uh, a rock band. Oh. And uh, it's a Tom Petty cover band. All so right. um, that's my next focus. Are you the lead singer? Because <laughs> you, you kind of look like Tom Petty. What's that? Are you the lead singer? Uh, you know, I, I didn't get in early enough to, to, to get us a, a vocal part. I can actually, uh, sing, uh, uh, fairly well, fairly well, uh, a few of his songs, but, uh, uh, they already have a vocalist, but, uh, I, I'm not giving up on that thought. I, I do play the guitar, so I'm definitely going to be a guitarist, but, uh, hopefully a singing, uh, member as well. Well, a, a story you might appreciate, and maybe some of my listeners will. A few weeks ago, my wife and I went and saw a band called Led Zeppelin II. Ah. And they're a professional, long-term running Led Zeppelin cover band. And we went and saw this with some friends. And as soon as they started, I turned to my wife and I said, is this supposed to be funny? And she said, oh no, th- this is very, very serious stuff. And I had to stop myself from giggling because the lead singer, uh, as I told my wife, I said, this lead singer, he is no Jim Morrison, (laughs) right? But thank you for laughing. Uh, But uh, he was trying to act like Robert Plant. And obviously they had watched a lot of stock footage of how Robert Plant behaves. Yeah. But it was not him. I mean, he couldn't pull it off. and And I thought he would have been better to not even try and just yeah. make the song sound well. The the band was actually pretty good, but the lead singer, uh, not so good. And we were looking around at the people in the audience. And so I'm 50, so I'm a little late for Led Zeppelin. 
So a lot of the people in this audience are, it's, it's rare for me to go to a concert and be one of the youngest people. Um, a lot of the people in this audience are 60 plus watching this Led Zeppelin band and they're tripping like they're 18 and having a time of their lives. And I finally decided, I turned to my wife and I said, I don't think that they're hearing the music coming from the stage. I think they're hearing the song that they heard when they were 18. Yeah. You know, so it just brings back this flood of memories. So uh, I wish you the best with the Tom Petty thing. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and now I'm stalling because I had another question that I was going to ask you and I can't remember what. It, oh, now I know what it is. Can you, would you be willing to go to some conferences and show the film and talk about it um, around the country? Um, absolutely. Uh, in fact, even though um, this film is completed, it, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm done with it because, uh, as you may uh, know, Phil, it, 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 just because you make something, it doesn't mean you're going to get people knocking down your door to, to watch it. A lot of people don't even know about this, and I think there's a lot of conferences and organization, uh, secular type, humanist, atheist uh, conference people that I would think would be um, excited to have a film like this shown at the conference and, and have me as the filmmaker there uh, to talk about it. They just don't know about it. So, uh, again, I want to thank you for um, – giving me the exposure of, of being on your podcast, Phil, because th this is the challenge that I have is to try to get this film uh, in front of people like that who run these conferences who might uh, be able to uh, uh, showcase it at their conference. Well, I am by no stretch the, one of the larger uh, shows about atheism or secularism, but I do a lot of focus on conferences. I go to a lot of conferences and I know a lot of people that organize or help organize conferences that listen. So if they're listening, I'm going to recommend that you contact John to have him come and watch the movie and have the entire audience. And I'm going to make another uh, recommendation because of my recent experience at a TEDx event. Do not schedule the film viewing as a supplemental thing at nine o'clock at night. Put this in the middle of the show. The thing is not even a freaking hour Put this in the middle of the day, let people watch it while they're awake and have John talk about it. But John, if someone wants to do this, how do they reach you? They can uh, email me at uh, john at bigideavideo.biz. That's dot B-I-Z, bigideavideo.biz. So that would probably be the uh, the best way to reach me. Well, John, thank you so much for, A, making this movie. I really enjoyed it, watching it twice. I, I We talked about it months ago, and then I fucked up and didn't follow up to have you on. So uh, thank you for uh, reminding me about this. And then I watched it again, so I was uh, at least had it in my mind when we did the interview. I appreciate the movie. I appreciate the conversations that we've had. And uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to come on The Phil Ferguson Show. Oh, thank you, Phil. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me as a guest. Have a great day. You too. My mum only lied to me about one thing. Um, she, uh, she said there was a God. And, um... <laughs> but that's because when you're a working-class mum, Jesus is like an unpaid babysitter. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just sort of like, she wants you to be good. You know, the best of working class mum where I grew up could, she, she wasn't hoping I'd be a doctor or a lawyer. She hoped I wouldn't be stabbed to death in a barroom fight, you know. So, the best thing to do is, well, if, he, if he's God-fearing, then he'd be good. It's a good rule of thumb because, you know, I went to Sunday school from about the age of four till eight. There was just great teachings of Jesus. I love Jesus. He was my superhero. Um, he really was. God was magic, right? But Jesus was just a man. And what I loved about Jesus was he was kind. And he, he was brave, and I thought he was amazing. And um, I absolutely I thought he was brilliant, right? just a brilliant guy, you know. So I was about eight, and my brother must have been 19. He came in once, and uh, I was doing uh, something from the Bible. And I said, what are you doing? I said, oh, join Jesus. And he went, um, who was Jesus? And I said, well, he was, he was the son of God. He went, why do you believe in God? Right? And my mum went, Bob, shut up. 
and I knew she had something to hide. <laughs> and he was telling the truth. And I knew, I knew from body language. And then I worked it out and I was an atheist in an hour. In an hour? <laughs> yeah. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Of course, you should go check out that movie. And hopefully you enjoyed that interview. I don't have any reviews this week, so um, I have sads. If you like the show, it helps out a lot because it builds, I don't know, reputation. And I think some of the streaming services are more likely to recommend or advise shows that have more, especially if they're five-star reviews. The only two places I know that those exist are Stitcher and iTunes. So if you like the show or if you found it helpful to you, you could go make uh, a review there and that would help me out an awful lot. Uh, otherwise, send me your questions. I'll try to answer them either at email or maybe on the show. Phil at PolarisFinancialPlanning.com And I have uh, Christmas coming up. And uh, of course, it's going to get really stupid cold here in Chicago. So we're going to hunker down for the winter. And I'm starting to look at con conventions for 2018. If you know of a convention, especially if I've not talked about it yet, that is going to happen in 2018, a regional, local, small conference, even a one day thing where you're just going to have three speakers and you would like me to mention it on the show. Or if you would like to see if you can send somebody to, uh, be on the show for 10, 15 minutes, let me know. Again, that would also be at phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. Hope to see you at one of these conferences in 2018. Until then, ciao. 